players and coaches of the National Football League, the Super Bowl is their ultimate destination. It's their justification for sacrifice and their reward for greatness. In 1954, Landry met his counterpart and offensive coordinator Vince Lombardi. Both men served under head coach Jim Lee Howe. When you think about it today, you think, boy, Tom Landry coached in the defense, had Vince Lombardi coaching the offense. How in the world could they come up with something like that? Jim Lee Howe literally pumped up the footballs and got out of the way. When we scrimmaged, it was like a game, and we'd never let them score. The Giants had one of the great defenses in pro football history in the late 50s. And Landry helped bring that about. And because of that, there was always this competitiveness between Lombardi and Landry. The style was completely different. Lombardi was more vocal. He didn't mind chewing you out as a player. He didn't mind getting in your face. Come on, Henry Jordan. You can't go everyone. Get the out of there. Do it right. Whereas Tom. Tom you know, could hardly hear him. Stack a little bit more and your timing will be better if you'll stack a little bit more on the guard, okay? He was like a math teacher. He had calculated this down to the lowest possible percentage of a failing. They were so different, and yet they were so alike in making you believe in their system. Vince, of course, was a very devout Catholic. Tom was a very devout Protestant, so I guess they didn't go to church together but they certainly showed up on Sunday together. And consequently, we took a lousy football team and wound up ultimately winning the NFL championship in 56. When Lombardi went to Green Bay, I know that they exchanged playbooks. Were they friends? Yes. Were they antagonists? Yeah, on the football field. Did he respect Tom Landry? Lombardi used Tom Landry's defense all the time he was coaching. There's no other respect for that. Lombardi ran Landry's 4-3 defense in Green Bay and won five world championships. But when Landry became head coach in Dallas in 1960, he scrapped Lombardi's offense and created his own. Start where you're going to end up on a double shift, see? That way you can look at your situation before you shift the first time, see? Right. Four, three, set. Coach Landry got the most complicated, futuristic offense in the league. 
Coach Lombardi got uh, the most simple offense that we ever played, except it was hard to beat them. <laughs>
Otis Wilson was the first one there. Hogaboom is still the Dallas quarterback. Danny White. Didn't have a slight concussion. Here is Otis Wilson all over. And there is the interception. Mike Richardson. Touchdown there. A return of 36 yards. This fair defense comes and gets after him. I mean, there's been guys that Danny White faced all day. Now it's Gary Otis Wilson. And then he's just throwing it up there. Richardson was just standing there. I don't think Hogaboom saw Richardson. I don't think he saw a receiver. I don't think he saw anything. I don't know how much fun this is for a backup quarterback when he's getting this kind of pressure. Or any quarterback. Hogaboom steps up into the pocket. Going deep to Tony Hill. flexible, simplified it. When Landry freed up Staubach, the Cowboys won their final nine games and rolled into Super Bowl VI. Staubach drops back to pass, that's up, pass to him, good, touchdown! It's the hammer by Tinka! Great Tinka back to pass, looking safe, back to the 20-yard line, still safe, back to the 15, still being safe to the 10, he's got him, and far away! What do you think, coach? I don't think he, he expected the players to pick him up. That was one of the high points. They thought that much of him. That might have made me happier than winning the game, to see a big, huge smile. It's like an exorcism, you know. He finally got, he got the demons out of him. You think this now takes the uh, onus off that we can't win the big one anymore? That's, I would think so. Well, if it is, I don't know how you spell it, I'll tell you that. All of us were so happy for Coach Land because uh, we knew where this man had been and how he had stood up for us. This was for the guy who wore the hat. 
thoughts for the guy that mattered. I mean, throughout history, they can write anything they want to ever write about the Dallas Cowboys. But it begins and ends with one name, Tom Landry. Tom Landry was an engineer by education. When he drew on the board, it was so precise. He would draw the feet of the players when they'd step. Coach Landry prepared every offense and every defensive game plan. I, I've never seen any coach, you know, do that. Tom Landry's mind was constantly at work. In New York, he drew up the 4-3 defense, still a standard over 50 years later. In Dallas, he kept innovating. Everything in defense and offense is evolution. As we moved into the 60s, the offenses were able to influence the 4-3 and keep us from doing the things we did in the 50s. One of the weaknesses of the 4-3 defense was the ability for guards or even tight ends on a double team block to come in and get to the middle linebacker and seal that off. What we're trying to get is a seal here and a seal here and try to run this play in the alley. Coach Landry's flex defense was designed with the intent, number one, of keeping the middle linebacker free. We protect our middle linebacker. We've got to keep the big men off of him a little bit, and we think the flex does that. Fumbles the football, the Cowboys recover it. Very tough to go against that Dallas flex defense. And it was a combination of two defensive linemen tight to the line of scrimmage, with two defensive linemen off the line of scrimmage. We just try to offset some of our linemen to give us a, in a better position to control the types of blocking that they use today. It's all about angles. It's all about math. It's all about engineering. It's all about Tom Landry's education. It all fit. They cannot run against the Cowboys. It developed Doomsday 1. It developed Doomsday 2, two of the greatest defenses in NFL history. The NFL is such a me too league, a copycat league, but nobody copied the flex despite its success because of one simple reason. Nobody could teach it. Wilderness. He did a lot of innovative and creative things. Most teams lined up in two formations, what they called red and brown. We lined up in about 10. He became an innovator on offense, you know, using multiple formations, uh, motion, uh, moving players around, shotgun. To Tom Landry, football was like a chess game. The shotgun, Tom brought that back. He's the guy that started it in his so-called modern era of pro football. People say, why did the line get up and down? The line got up when the backs were shifting, so the defense couldn't see where the backs were shifting to. He was the defensive coordinator and the offensive coordinator at the same time. Even Vince Lombardi, even Paul Brown didn't do that. Defensively, he came up with the flex defense, which nobody else could coach but him. He would coach the defensive tackles, the defensive ends, the linebackers, the cornerbacks, the safeties. The kind of understood joke was that Tom resented the players on occasion from getting in the way of his system, which he knew he had designed perfectly, and he could prove it if only the stupid players would stop being human and messing it up. I was the most valuable player in Super Bowl XII along with Harvey Martin. That next year, the Cowboys drafted a defensive tackle, and I just knew that he drafted them to take my position. You know, he had all these signs around the uh, training facility, and one of those signs said there was no such thing as an indispensable man, and that meant you are a cog in the wheel, indispensable man, and that meant are a cog in the wheel. Landry's systematic approach reached a bizarre height against Chicago in 1971. He shuttled quarterbacks Craig Morton and Roger Staubach on every play. Dallas lost 23-19. Coach made a big mistake. I think he really started to understand it was a combination of his preparation as well as having the right players emotionally, you know, teaming with him. 
In 1966, the right combination of blackboard schemes and passionate personnel not only took the Cowboys past the 500 mark for the first time, they almost beat Green Bay for the NFL championship. And it only got better. Over two decades, Dallas went to the playoffs 18 times and reached five Super Bowls, winning two. But even in the glow of his extended success, Landry remained a coach of heart, admired but seldom loved. I think my first five years with the Cowboys, I didn't like him at all. After we became really successful, then you believed in him. The problem when you're coaching is much like being a CEO. If you get too close to someone, you can't do the things that you need to do. Coach wasn't a touchy-feely type person. If you were meeting at 10 o'clock, you'd be there at 10 o'clock. If you were in a wreck on Central Expressway, you should have left earlier. I was over at the practice field on crutches watching practice, and, and he asked me where I was going to be at the game. I said, well, you know, I'll be on the sidelines. He says, no, I think you should probably just sit in the stands. It was not nearly as easy for him to give out the attaboys and way to go and good job as it was to critique how you had missed your assignment. Landry's detached approach was never more apparent than in his relationship with quarterback Don Meredith. The bravest thing that I ever saw was when he got out of the hospital and he had a broken rib and a punctured lung and pneumonia. And we went up and played in Cleveland. And we all played lousy. And Don took the brunt of that. Well, uh, he's in the hospital getting the blood pumped out of his lung. Tom is uh, holding a meeting saying what a bad game Don played. And it hurt Don so bad, people didn't realize how sensitive he is. I think that's the one ingredient that is missing from his personality, and that is a physical show to his team that he cares about what they do, whether it's good or whether it's bad. I've never seen him hug a player. I wondered for a long time if 10 years after Don Meredith retired at the age of 31, Tom didn't look in the mirror and say, maybe if I would have told him how much we needed him, uh, things might have been different. The degree of separation between Landry and his players can be measured by his Spartan beginnings in South Texas. Landry may have had a jaw of granite but not a heart of stone. People thought, well, he's cold-hearted, he can just cut guys in, he brings them in, you know, you're no longer a cowboy. No, it hurt him. I watched him break down and cry when we cut a player. Ken Hutchinson was a linebacker and a good player. When he cut him, he stood at that podium and cried. He said, I had to let it go of a friend today. You know, and the tears just coming down his face. Guys who I know for a fact didn't like playing for him, didn't like him because he was too strict, too cold, too detached. What happened, Charlie? After they were what done happened? playing for him. Talked about him like he was their father. You know, I had a feeling for him that similar to, a, you know, someone you know, similar to a, you know, a father image. He had a bigger impact on me than my father. Okay. You know, it was like your father you wanted to please him. And when he was disappointed in you, you felt that. You didn't just feel it peripherally, you felt that inside. Landry was not as stoic as he appeared. He cared about his players. And occasionally it showed. Like when Drew Pearson almost lost his life in a car accident. One look at Drew Pearson's car would indicate that he was lucky to be alive. Lost my brother in the accident and I'm fighting for my life. But every time I opened my eyes, there were three people I would always see. One was Harvey Martin, my best friend. The other was Roger Staubach, my quarterback. And the third person that shocked me was Tom Landry. The loss of his brother and, and the responsibility he felt, you know, is just really a, a pretty tough thing to handle. This was a time where we were about to go into a, a mini camp. He was there throughout the whole time. Didn't even coach the mini camp. I did not know he felt that way about me because he never showed that. But then again, that's the man. When Thomas Henderson marked 10 years of being drug free, he caught a glimpse of the man behind the mask. Well, he came to my 10 year anniversary. Didn't know if he'd come. It would have saved me. The night of the event, he walked into the room and he got on the podium and said uh, to the audience that if I knew then what I know now, I would have handled Thomas differently. Thomas has made a tremendous turnaround, you know, in his life. We can say he's Hollywood, and we can say he talks a lot and anything, but 
When a guy does what he does, he has a great heart. And that's awful important. And Thomas, boy, I tell you, I wish I'd have had you all through your career. We may have had seven or eight Super Bowls before it was over with. I got emotional about that. He was just a great man, you know, misunderstood, but a great man. Landry wanted the focus strictly on the field. Well, the Cowboys need a miracle. And there, Dallas stole the spotlight in the 1970s. Pearson makes the catch at the five, touchdown! The Steelers may have won more Super Bowls, but the Cowboys captured the country's imagination. I mean, you gotta love the Cowboys. They're the most exciting team in the NFL. Landry took the Cowboys to seven NFC championships and five Super Bowls during the decade. Let's play together all day long. Let's go. The high point was a second Lombardi trophy for Landry in Super Bowl 12. Pitch out, Newhouse goes left, pulls up, wants to pass, fires it deep for Goldie Richards. Good touchdown! This was a testament to the faith in the system and the way Landry continued to evolve as a coach, as a teacher, and as a strategist. And there he goes, Landry, still calm, still collected. We'll put on another ring. The really first real shot in the film is Tom Landry in silhouette with his hat. And you know it's Tom Landry. It knocks you out from the minute you see it. It is so special. When you see that image, I don't think you can overstate the success and the impact of Bob Ryan constructing this iconography and this idea of them being America's team. The Cowboys could not have become America's team without Landry's image. His man in the hat persona tapped into the myth of the Cowboy and the coach's constant portrayal in Western iconography cast a long shadow. The profile is unmistakable. The face belongs carved on Mount Rushmore. There are a lot of similarities of the Western hero to Landry. He evoked the Wild West in what he was. For what they call the shotgun. Five yards back and Roger can see it all. They go for the shotgun. Roger looks left, fires it out there, caught by Tony Hill. Touchdown, Cowboys! He projected the image of a cowboy. Tom Landry had a, a John Wayne kind of uh, appeal. You know me, I'm one of the best known cowboys in Texas. But a lot of people don't recognize me in a cowboy hat. When he did that American Express commercial with the cowboy stuff on, I'm surprised he didn't take that outfit and wear it on the sideline for a game. Wow. Because you never know when you're going to be surrounded by Redskins. Every generation's told to be more willing to express their emotions and be open about how they feel. Tom Landry was masculine but not demonstrative. He was a stoic person. The opposite of how society and culture has gone. The hole in Texas Stadium is not as big as the hole in any theory that attempts to explain Tom Landry the most perplexing personality in the National Football League. No one has penetrated the gunfighter stare, the grim face that makes him look like a regional director of the FBI. Somebody asked me, you ever see Coach Landry smile? And I said, no, but I've only been here nine years. Landry was the cigarette-less Marlboro man. What is there about that that you don't want to emulate in the 70s? And politicians understood that. And I am very proud to say that Wednesday, Tom Landry announced his personal support for my campaign. Tom Landry made people think that there really could be, once again, 
excellence in America based upon faith and principles and toughness. That's the way I think America's always liked to see itself. And Tom Landry was what they wanted to see in the mirror. I don't know if Tom is scared. Montana on the rollout to the right side. Being chased, finally fires in the end zone. Clark, touchdown! In the 1980s, Landry's Cowboys fell short in three straight NFC Championship games, then began to fall apart. He was the reason for his own demise. The league had taken all of his innovative schemes and taken it to another level. Well, the flex defense became I hate to say it, obsolete. And I went in to see him one offseason, and I suggested to him that we go to the three-man front. Well, when I presented that to him, he looked at me like I had accosted his daughter or something, you know. Uh, it, it was just like, it was taboo. He was the coach who was in total control and suddenly had lost control of the cogs. There was a new wave of players who weren't buying into the mystique. Landry and the Cowboys had become mortal. In 1985, they suffered the worst defeat in team history at the hands of Landry disciple, Mike Ditka. Did I feel like beating my dad? I felt worse. He took a chance on me as a player when I wasn't sure I could play anymore. And he took a chance on me as a coach when I didn't know if I could coach. He gave me two opportunities in life to change my life completely. And I said, coach, I'm sorry. You know, I, I really am. I respect Tom Lander. He'll be in the Hall of Fame. There's no question about that. But uh, I think the game's passed him by just a The public was screaming for him to be removed as a coach. Screaming every night. I took calls every night. And I walked to the top of these stairs, and I see a saddle-colored leather jacket, and it's Tom Lander. He's coming. I just didn't know what to do to help him out. And uh, I guess we end up saying, well, we need to get rid of him, you know, because we had no way to take care of him. And I think that was the most disappointing thing. As the 1980s wound down, disappointment began to build in Dallas as the Cowboys started losing, and the living legend that was Landry began to fade. Montana rolling out the right, looking toward the end zone, throwing under pressure, throws his pass, caught by Clark! dramatic 28-27 defeat by the 49ers in January of 1982 was the second of three straight NFC Championship game losses. In 1986, the Cowboys dropped... assume looking at those circumstances some sort of threat in regard to Landry but Tom is not on the sidelines as we start the fourth period he went walking off the field with a police escort and he is very much aware of what it looks like if he doesn't come back out after learning he was the target of a death threat Landry returned to the field wearing a bulletproof vest Tom Landry flew bomber missions in the war he's not bowing down to some crackpot calling in a threat. I didn't like it at all. I wasn't sure, you know, that there's somebody wasn't planning to do that. I did notice the players were standing next to him. <laughs> and I thought that was a, another moment where a lot of the players looked up and said, wow, he is fearless. Tom, you're amazingly calm for somebody who just got their life break. I don't know. as far as 
Him and he enlisted right then as an 18 year old at the time and he wanted to go in the army air corps which his brother was in it was personal by 1944 second lieutenant thomas landry was part of the 493rd bomb group of the eighth air force he was a co-pilot flying missions over europe in a b-17 now 98 years old, was also part of the Mighty Eighth during World War II. I was flying the B-17 Flying Fortress. I was a commander. I was the first pilot. 18-year-old kids, that's all we were. We didn't have any idea how bad it really was. During the war, Landry took the right seat of his B-17 as co-pilot flying out of England across the channel on bombing missions in Europe in 1944 and 45. The survival rate for B-17 pilots and their crew was less than 50%. When we got there, it was just a cloud of black smoke from flak as you headed into the target. It was like flying inside of a thundercloud. You just make the run, drop your bombs, and get out of the target area as quickly as you could. That image of flying with flag exploding all around you. One o'clock high, they're coming around, watch them. Dad flew 30 missions. That's 30 chances to go up and not come back. with what you got to do. That line between life and death is the most paramount thing that a person can experience. Dad going through that, I think, helped him and focused him and just, you know, helped make him the person that he was and the coach that he was. Super Bowl wins. If there was one moment as a coach that personified Landry's dedication to mission, it came in 1986 in Anaheim when he coached the fourth quarter wearing a bulletproof vest. The call, as you were told, came from somebody's brother reporting the fact that his brother was in the stadium with a rifle. Yeah, that's what, that's what I understand. His target was me. They felt that I should leave it at the end of the third quarter and go in and make a decision whether to stay in or put on a vest and come back out. So I decided to put a vest on and come back out again. 
as dangerous as it was, that that was not going to affect him. I don't think Coach had fear. <laughs> not go Flannery. One of the game's greatest coaches who served as part of a country's greatest generation. With honor. at that time, whether you came back or not, wasn't the important thing. So I could see myself doing it all again. Now that sounds like Coach Landry. I think he's a total hero. I mean, every, every aspect of his life. The fact that he was lucky enough to survive and to come home and to do the things that he did later on in his life, I'm very grateful for that. Landry was not bulletproof. For the first time in two decades, Dallas was a losing team, making Landry vulnerable in the eyes of owner Bum Bright. Bright did not love the fact that Tom had no use for him. So when he decided to sell the Cowboys, he handpicked a lesser bid from this unknown guy from Arkansas, Jerry Jones, because Jerry was the only potential buyer who said, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to keep Coach Landry. I'm going to bring my own guy in, Jimmy Johnson. The truth is, Tex wanted to make a coaching change. Tex told me, he said, you have a luxury that I don't have. He said, I've worked with Tom for 29 years, and it just wasn't in me to make a change. If the previous owner, Bum Bright, had any respect for Tom Landry, he would have let Coach Landry know this new guy is very interested in bringing in his own coach. I don't think that was Jerry Jones' responsibility. I got on the plane with Tex, and uh, we went down to Austin to have our visit with him there at the golf course. We were on the second tee, and a message was sent down that Tex Schramm uh, would be coming to see him, uh, and so to stay close. There was a clubhouse area that was private. And we went in there and they had a discussion. I was very aware of how sensitive uh, this meeting was. And I really did know how he was revered and respected as the coach of the Dallas Cowboys. And I basically said, coach, the thing that I do feel is in best interest of everyone is that we make the coaching change right now. Coach Landry shook my hand. Uh, he was uh, majestic. Uh, he was just as you would expect Coach Landry to be, and uh, said, I wish you the best, and uh, uh, we parted. Bum Bright, you know, he, he rides off into the sunset, you know, with the big white hat on and the white horse, and here's Jerry Jones from Arkansas who fired Tom Landry. And this is just a classless act. They've embarrassed us. We are proud people. We're uh, proud of our football team and proud of all this, and the way they've done it has just torn that all down. I think that Buddy Ryan of Philadelphia's got more class than our new owner, Jerry Jones. <laughs> Announcing I had bought the team right in the same moment that I visited with Coach Landry about the change. Those weren't to be in the same day, and it was a real mistake. And people in Dallas, Texas, still refer to it as the Saturday Night Massacre. Y'all, you look like you're in pretty good shape. You're dressed for the occasion. You look pretty sharp, too. The funeral? Uh, <laughs> the biggest mistake never made. Okay, you don't fire Tom Landry. Tom Landry? He made football. You never know how many fouls <laughs> you have, boy, when you try to clean them out. Gosh, it's amazing. To see him being forced to clean out his desk for the last time after 29 years was a crushing sight for every Dallas Cowboy fan. If you see Tom Landry putting picture frames in a cardboard box, what does that make him? Makes him just like you and me. We don't want to hear about that. Tom Landry's not like you and me. He's Tom Landry. It's very, very uh, sad. 
It's tough when you break a relationship that we've had for 29 years. For five years, Texas E. Schramm tried to finesse the graceful exit for God's coach, Coach Landry. And in the end, it took the image of the villain, Jerry Jones, the Saturday Night Massacre, to allow Coach Landry to become the martyr that he deserved to be. Sort of that Christian motif, it's like he was sacrificed and went to heaven. Slightly overstated, but true. Sold the Cowboys in February of 1989. New owner Jerry Jones flew to Austin with general manager Tex Schramm to fire the man with 270 victories. My eyes were running. And, uh, he just uh, walked out and I was there and I said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. Disappointment was probably the number one uh, emotion. It's just an unfortunate circumstance that it happened, and, and, and no, it wasn't handled real well. It's just unfortunate that Dex Ram and Tom Landry can give their lives and build the Dallas Cal Cowboy, but business also has to be addressed in close contact, and that's what we have. I know he was hurt, and I know he was angry, but he managed to be those things without being bitter. That's a huge measure of the man to me. In appreciation for Landry turning an expansion team into one of the most successful franchises in professional sports, the city of Dallas honored him with a parade. I have never heard of 50,000 people coming to a parade for a coach who had a 313 record the year before. I'll never be in another press conference again, but when I see you on the street, I'll sure say hello. Landry, a true test of his stoicism and faith, came in 1995. After a four-year struggle, his daughter Lisa died of cancer. I have come to have faith in God, who is with me in every storm. My youngest daughter, Lisa, many of you heard her story, taught us how to live in grace and with courage and faith. Four years later, in 1999, Landry was diagnosed with leukemia. He stayed tough to the end. When they got the final diagnosis, well, his grandson had a baseball game. And so they were a little late, but they went out there and sat in the stands as if nothing was wrong. I think he, he felt like if that was God's will, then that was God's will. And I don't believe that I ever heard him complain. There's a consistency about his behavior that is stronger than anyone I've ever known. Every time I visited with him in the hospital, he expressed gratitude and appreciation for my being there. I kept thinking to myself, I'm the one that's being strengthened by this man. Tom Landry, the former coach of the Dallas Cowboys, was not only a champion many times over, he was one of football's great innovators. Landry died of leukemia yesterday at the age of 75. When he passed away, so many people came back and said, gosh, Coach Landry had such a dramatic effect, a change in my life. And the thing that Coach Landry did that was so unique is that he planted a seed within you that just continued to grow for a long time. He didn't know it. And it really changed you as a person. People thought who idolized him that he was perfect. People thought who found him hypocritical that he was a charlatan. He wasn't either one of those things. And I think the best thing people can say about him is that he was a human being. He was a hell of a human being, but he was a human being. I think one of the greatest tributes to my father was that when he, when he passed away, that this town shut down for a week. Well, you don't do that for a guy that's won a few football games. I went to the service, to the graveyard, and I just, uh, I lost it. I mean, I really lost it. If you're lucky in your life, a man will come through your life that makes a difference. We had a rocky relationship, but I'm so glad I knew him. I'm glad I met him. I know that I'm better because of knowing Tom Landry.